Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are in the Zoom right now and for those of you who are following us on uh, YouTube and Twitter, welcome to our book talk with Phil Gordon. Uh, Phil recently published the book, Losing the Long Game, The False Promise of Regime Change in the Middle East. And we will have a discussion about his book. And uh, I will have some questions to him. And uh, you can write your questions to Q&A box on Zoom if you are uh, following on Zoom. And if you are following on uh, Twitter and YouTube, you have to write your questions on the comment section. My assistants will collect those questions and send it to me in the meantime. Just a short introduction. I don't know if you need one, Phil. Phil Gordon is the Mary and David Bowles Senior Fellow for US Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. He served as Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and White House Coordinator for Middle East from 2013 to 2015, and Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs from 2009 to 2013. Of course, he has uh, some other books, including Allies at War and Winning the Right War. And uh, today we will talk about his most recent book. Phil, welcome and uh, congratulations for the book and thank you, thank you for taking time. And uh, I read your book and uh, it is, it's, a, it's an interesting pattern actually. It was always there, but nobody put them together to bring that this is actually a pattern. And it's a pattern of US engagements uh, in the Middle East actually, military engagements for regime change. And uh, there are familiar patterns, uh, exaggerated trust, wishful thinking, failed military intervention, premature victory, uh, and celebrations, of course, and often disastrous long-term uh, consequences. But before we move on the Middle East, uh, I want to, uh, and the uh, regime change attempts of the US over there, I want you to tell us a little bit about how you uh, basically discovered this pattern and tell us a little more about the, because the regime change attempts of the US was not only in uh, Middle East. Before that, uh, you mentioned in your book, Vietnam, for example, the Diem regime, right? And we, uh, when we were student in Turkey, we all know about the Latin American cases, right? Uh, CIA sponsored coup in Chile against Allende in 1973 and uh, the role of Pinochet. We raised by watching some of the Costa Gavras movies like Missing and uh, what it led to actually, especially uh, human rights violations, repression of the opposition, etc. And Reagan administration attempt, of course, to overthrow uh, Sandinista government in Nicaragua. So regime change uh, attempts of the US is not something new, but it is not something old. When did it start and how did it come to the Middle East? First, I want this, explain me the pattern and explain me the other examples around the world. And then we will move to the Middle East. Uh, great, Kilich. Uh, first, thanks for having me. I look forward to this discussion. You've already raised a whole bunch of really big and important topics. I'll, I'll try to do my best. But I'm glad you use this word patterns in, in your opening statement, because that is what the book really demonstrates, is uh, how in many ways similar uh, these events are, even when in other ways they're very different. Because you could immediately say, you mentioned a couple of the cases I look at. It's a book about U.S. regime change in the Middle East over the past 70 years. So it goes all the way back to the CIA-supported intervention and coup in Iran in 53. But then there are two cases in Afghanistan, you know, supporting the Mujahideen in the 1980s against the Soviet-backed government, uh, overthrowing the Taliban. Uh, then obviously the Iraq War, 2003, which is, you know, the classic regime change. But then quite interestingly, especially for me, given my uh, role in the Obama administration, was efforts to do so more recently in Egypt, Libya, and Syria. Now you could immediately say, you know, uh, pushing out Mubarak diplomatically in Egypt is very different from invading Iraq. So, you know, how are these things similar? Well, they're similar in several ways. Uh, what they all have in common is that they were cases where the United States decided it was our policy to get rid of a regime and to replace it with something else for many different reasons, right? Sometimes this had to do with the Cold War, Sometimes it was weapons of mass destruction. Sometimes it was terrorism. Sometimes it was just saving lives. Uh, but whatever the reason, it was a case where the United States made it a policy to uh, change the regime. And we also did it lots of different ways. Uh, uh, I already mentioned you know, the CIA sponsored coup, but other cases we support the opposition like in Afghanistan, in Iraq, we invade and occupy the country. In Egypt, it was just diplomacy. 
Uh, in Libya, it was a NATO intervention. In Syria, it was support for the opposition. So those are all differences, but these patterns come up over and over again. And what you see in all of these cases is that once the United States decides to, decides to get rid of the regime, we tend to overstate the threat in order to build public support, under, underestimate the costs. And in every case, the costs were underestimated, sometimes vastly. Um, and in every case, we produce unintended consequences where things happen afterwards that were not uh, designed to happen. Uh, and uh, as you also noted, we tend to premature declare, prematurely declare victory. That's the title of the book, Losing the Long Game, because in most of these cases, initially it looks like a success. And I talk about, as I go through these different examples, there's like a mission accomplished mo moment in most of these cases where we do get rid of the regime, we have a big celebration because we succeeded, quote unquote, but then uh, we create a security vacuum and things start to go wrong. So what I discovered uh, to answer your question is that there just seems to be this tendency over the decades for a lot of different reasons to believe that we can take our power and successfully uh, change regimes in the Middle East, but frankly, the track record of doing so is very poor. Uh, uh, just very briefly on you know, Middle East versus not Middle East, because you also asked about that. And yes, it's true. This is hardly a phenomenon uh, exclusive to the Middle East. Um, I focused on the Middle East mostly because that's where the current debate uh, is. There's a debate about whether we should pursue regime change in Iran. We have tried to, and this is still a debate about whether we should pursue regime change in Syria. There are other people who have in mind you know, getting rid of and changing regimes elsewhere throughout the region. So that's what seemed to me it being most topical. I mean, this is a historical work, but it's meant to inform current policy. And I think it's most relevant to the Middle East. And I also think there are peculiarities or particularities about the Middle East that makes it even more challenging than elsewhere. In the course of the conversation, I'm happy to talk more about some of the other precedents because uh, every time there's a debate about intervening in the Middle East, people bring up these precedents, including the allegedly positive ones like World War II with Germany and Japan or cases in Latin America. But the focus of this work has been primarily on Middle Eastern cases. So uh, uh, thank you. And uh, the first case you uh, focus on is the Mossadegh, the coup, CIA-sponsored coup against the Mossadegh government in Iran. And uh, as you mentioned in your book, it created uh, the rise of anti-Americanism, which led to the C basically the taking of the hostages of Americans at the US embassy after the revolution and terrorist attacks uh, by Iran and its proxies to US targets. Uh, and in planning of the coup, uh, you have this quote, uh, I just wanted to read it, it's on page 33. The plan, uh, basically CIA and uh, British intelligence plan would consist in bribing journalists, editors, Islamic preachers, opinion leaders to undermine the government and fan the flames of distrust. Stories would be planted to show Mossadegh as a communist collaborator and as a fanatic, and thugs would be hired to organize protests and create chaos and instability on the streets. So this is, you know, like the, for the people who read about uh, Latin America, Africa, and Middle East, this sounds a very familiar pattern. Do you think this is also a pattern of U.S. support of uh, different coups in Middle East and in Africa, in Latin America, and the uh, ones that maybe we don't know yet. <laughs> uh, I do, and, and there's several things to say about that. One is, in fact, um, I call the chapter that you're referring to original sin, mm -hmm. uh, which maybe overstates it a little bit, but that is precisely the notion that I'm getting at, that this was an early case in the post-World War II period where we did it, and because it seemed like a success in the short term, it became the model for other interventions. In fact, again, you asked about other cases. It was only the following year in Guatemala that we, uh, we did another coup to overthrow a government in the context of the Cold War. And one reason we did that was because it looked like this Iran coup was a model for how to go about pursuing your interests. It didn't cost very much. We got rid of this prickly nationalist. We kept Iran out of the Soviet camp, which was Eisenhower's reason for doing it. And so, uh, you know, you had the, the Dulles brothers, Secretary of State and CIA director in Washington thinking, this is how, uh, how to, to, to go about foreign policy. Remember Eisenhower, even though he was a, a general, you might even say because he was a general, 
didn't think the United States should be in the business of you know, fighting wars in Asia. And he wanted to reduce, keep American budget deficit under control, defense spending under control. So he discovered, quote unquote, this other way of doing things where you didn't have to invade Iran to get rid of the government you didn't like. You could do it through these uh, covert interventions. So then proceeded to do it again in Guatemala and uh, eventually developed plans to do it in Cuba, where you know, also in the context of the Cold War, there was a regime we didn't like. And the Bay of Pigs, of course, was launched under the Kennedy administration, but it was conceived uh, uh, under the Eisenhower administration. So the short answer is yes, this was in some ways uh, a technique that the United States discovered at the time that it would then use uh, later because of the apparent success. And I, I say, and this is the other thing I wanted to say in response to your question, I say apparent success because Iran is a case, Iran 53 is a case where uh, you, you really could say that in many ways it was a short-term success or not even so short-term because uh, Iran stayed in the Western camp and the pro-American camp for 25 years before the unintended consequences really started to come out. And it was the you know, years of repression under the Shah that led to this anti-American resentment, frankly led in part also to this uh, Islamist uh, extremist movement that manifested itself in the revolution and the taking of American hostages, and that now we've been living with for 40 years of hostility since then. Um, now, none of that was obviously guaranteed by the intervention itself, but it is fair to say that by intervening, we halted Iran's potential democratic uh, process and in some ways delegitimized the monarchy, which kept power, but not you know, in a legitimate way, but through force and then paid a uh, long-term price for doing so. Uh, then the, your next case is about Afghanistan. And it's uh, actually a, a long journey that starts in 1979 and it goes all the way actually today, right? It is, uh, although there is an agreement between Taliban uh, right now, it is, we are not sure if it will be implemented. We don't see the outcomes yet. And when we see, uh, when, when I read your Afghanistan case and there were actually warnings, right? Prime Minister Bhutto warned about that, that uh, this unconditional support may lead to disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, at that time, the director of CIA, uh, Robert Gates, said a lot of people actually that U.S. is supporting were not the people you invite for dinner. And there's also another quote that you wouldn't let your daughter to marry with one of them. So right. why United States kept uh, supporting that? So it is not only the warning, not only comes from Pakistan, but from the very higher echelons of the US government. Mm -hmm. What does go wrong? Where does the message doesn't reach to the very top that United States keep making that mistake? Right, so this is definitely in the category of unintended consequences. And there are a lot of interesting things about the Afghanistan case. Uh, one is the, the slippery slope. You know, when I talk about the differences in these cases, some of them are clear right from the start. The United States says policy is regime change and we're going to do it. That was in Iraq, right? 2003, Bush administration said we're getting rid of Saddam. Afghanistan wasn't that. Um, in fact, it, there's an even better comparison between the first Afghanistan and the second one. The first one against the Soviet-backed government in the 80s it took many years to even settle on a policy of regime change, like from 1979 to the mid eighties, and then another half decade to achieve it. Whereas the second intervention in Afghanistan was a matter of weeks after 9-11 and the Taliban protecting the people who uh, perpetrated 9-11, you know, it took weeks to decide we're getting rid of the Taliban and then a couple more weeks to actually do so. But the first one was a slippery slope in that even before uh, um, the Reagan administration, the Carter administration began, as you noted in 1979, to start supporting the uh, opposition. Then of course the Soviets intervened, they invade in, uh, it, it, uh, on Christmas day, 1979, and Carter pivots to a much tougher policy of providing assistance to the Afghan opposition. But the goal wasn't yet regime change, Carter had no, notion that he could get rid of the Soviet-backed regime, we wanted to just make them pay a price. So it starts off as just, all right, the Soviets intervened, we don't like that, we're gonna support the opposition to make them pay a price. Then Reagan comes in and says, no, they have to pay a big price 
And not only do they have to pay a big price, we want to get rid of the Soviets. So then we start arming the opposition uh, along with Pakistan and uh, increase the cost on Moscow even more. Uh, and then, you know, that, that, of course, it doesn't, it's not quick or easy. It's a few more years before we start providing Stinger missiles and other advanced military equipment to really up the pressure. And then finally, you know, after a decade of this support, the Soviets decide to pull out. And there too, in terms of this mission accomplished moment, I tell the story you probably saw in the book that uh, the CIA station chief in Pakistan sent a fax back to Washington that just said, we won. Because there was this giddy feeling in Washington that by supporting the opposition, we, uh, uh, we succeeded. And then uh, the Soviets leave. And then a few years after that, finally, uh, the Afghan government itself collapses. So this is another one where you could tell the story in a very positive way. For a relatively small amount of money, the United States backed the opposition, overthrew the Soviet-backed communist regime, and had a big victory in the Cold War. But like all of these cases, you then have to play it out. And that's where this one is, is so interesting in that, yes, we did undermine the Soviets and get rid of that government we didn't like, but we also contributed to a decade-long horrific civil war that killed about a 10th of the Afghan population, drove millions into Pakistan. It was then followed by warlords competing over Kabul and fighting each other. It only really, that civil conflict only really ended when the Taliban came and took over Afghanistan. They then harbored Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda attacks the United States and we do regime change again and put in a big force afterwards and essentially 20 years and a trillion dollars later, we're still there with the Taliban potentially forced to come back. So when you look at it in the broad scheme of things, that great success of the first Afghanistan intervention, you know, you can ask some real questions about that too in the long run. And uh, there is another pattern actually, before we skip to Iraq and uh, other countries and US intervention, there is the marketing, the continuation of the war, uh, especially emphasizing the progress uh, by the administration and uh, how the media every time falls into this, right? We remember from the Pentagon papers that there was this uh, attempt which was uh, revealed uh, later. And uh, you mentioned December 2019 Washington Post revelations especially about the reports, false reports about the progress actually in Afghanistan. And we probably would have a lot of them in regards to Iraq, right? Uh, because there was multiple times George Bush, Dick Cheney and other administration officials, Donald Rumsfeld mentioned that there is an immense amount of progress, which, turn, which may turn out to be in the coming years after different revelations that not true actually. We can see it on the ground, but we didn't have the uh, papers about that yet. Why the media and public opinion falls for this false hope each and every time? Uh, fascinating question, an important one. Uh, and you're right about the similarities and you're right to bring up the Pentagon Papers. The uh, similarities between the Pentagon Papers and the Afghanistan revelations of 2019 are striking. I would just maybe clarify one thing. We say, you know, why does the media do this? Mm -hmm. The media is in, in some ways more the consumer than the than the producer of this narrative. It's, it's the government itself that uh, tends to uh, overstate progress being made. And that's obviously the case in Vietnam where generals would repeatedly make the case to the American public, and that's what the Pentagon Papers revealed, that we were, you know, they would do body counts and we were making progress on the ground and we turned the corner and the administrations would do that too. too. And, and it wasn't true, in fact, in, in the case of Vietnam, they knew it wasn't true and they peddled it anyway. But you see the same thing in Iraq uh, in Afghanistan, particularly. In Iraq, the administration was always saying, yes, you know, the first X amount of time was difficult, but now we've turned the corner. We are making good progress. You know, these are dead enders. When they weren't dead enders, they were a, a massive insurgency, but even more in Afghanistan. And, uh, uh, you know, I also tell that story in the book. You don't have to wait till the 2019 Washington Post revelations to know that there was this pattern where new commanders would come in and say, all right, it's true, we can acknowledge that the last year was difficult, but now uh, we've got a new approach, making great progress. We've trained X number of Afghan uh, police forces, X number of Afghan security forces, and now we're making progress. And you know, if you were following Afghanistan closely, you knew that that just wasn't the case. Um, so you, you can ask why. And, and 
you know, one explanation of it is just sort of a natural human thing. And as you noted, you know, I was in the administration, an administration that was trying to make Afghanistan succeed. So I know and even sympathize with this. You want to believe you're making progress. You know, when you've invested so much in something, you've made the case to the public that it was necessary to do. You've made the case to the public that their interests are at stake. And this gets back to this thing about selling and, you know, the the moment once a government has decided to, to pursue the policy of regime change, you have to win support and sell it. So you persuade yourself, and you persuade the public that this is a, a vital national interest. And it's, uh, it's almost, uh, you know, it's what the French would call déformation professionnelle. You, uh, if your job is to succeed in keeping the peace in Afghanistan, then you're going to have that mindset. And it is understandable. If you're in the U.S. military and you've been deployed to Afghanistan, you need that attitude because how else are you going to succeed in your job? If you're an administration that is trying to build support and win in, in Afghanistan, you almost can't allow yourself to think that you're not making progress. But when you step back as an analyst can do and look over the long term, you discover that part of the pattern is just a relentless, uh, excessively positive take on, on what is going on. And that's how you end up in situations where you're still there after 20 years, making the case that, you know, we finally turned a corner when in fact, we're seeing the same pattern over and over again. Uh, I was, uh, even after the announcement of this event, I started to receive some questions about the US regime change attempts in uh, Middle East. And what is the question was, what is the role of Israel? or other actors in the region in pushing United States for the regime change. And you mentioned in your book, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's at that time, uh, November 2002, uh, expert witness actually in the Congress saying that it will have a positive reverberations to overthrow the regime in Iraq. So uh, do you think the uh, other countries in the region uh, would have some impact on the decision-making of the US when the United States is making these decisions? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, a lot of countries in the Middle East and in Europe, frankly, have played an important role one way or another, sometimes for and sometimes against. And yes, there are cases where Israel was for, and that's one at the time Netanyahu was just an opposition mm -hmm. figure. He wasn't the Israeli government, because I think Israelis had mixed views on the Iraq invasion at the time, but a lot of them supported it, and Netanyahu was one. But I wouldn't overstate that variable, and I try in the Iraq chapter to be very careful in uh, figuring out what the real motivations were. And, and guess what? There were a lot of different ones. You can't find a single variable um, uh, or cause. Uh, I think more than anything in the United States, it was the post 9-11 uh, anxiety about weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. And in one reason, I think that's the most convincing explanation is that the same people who had opposed regime change in Iraq before 9-11 were suddenly big proponents of it. I mean, Bush himself was a sort of, you know, he was a cautious president who said, you know, we should be focused on things at home. Dick Cheney, uh, before 9-11, you know, in the first Gulf War, he was one of those most against going to Baghdad and doing regime change. But after 9-11, there was just this feeling and Bush came to the view that we could never be safe if you have a regime out there that potentially had a weapons of mass destruction and supported terrorism. And he bought into this notion that the real problem behind terrorism was the repressive nature of some of the regimes that were turning their publics into extremists. So he bought into this notion that if you could just get rid of that, democracy would spread throughout the region and that would solve the terrorism problem. Now, I argue in the book that analytically that was just uh, wrong. I mean, it was true that if somehow you could set up a peaceful liberal democracy in Iraq, that would be a positive incentive for Iraq's neighbors. But I think the administration then fell into the trap of just persuading itself that we, we were somehow uh, capable of getting rid of this regime and putting a flourishing liberal democracy in place in Iraq. And that turned out to be a vast miscalculation. So there are a lot of variables. And so it is, is, did uh, Israel pl play a role in some of these things? I wouldn't overstate that variable. I, I uh, underscore in other cases where it's other countries like our in intervention in Libya, where it's the Europeans who maybe, you know, we'll come to that when we talk about Libya, 
The Europeans play a decisive role in persuading the United States to go in. Uh, other Arab voices in that case were also critical in pushing the United States in that direction. So yes, in almost all of these cases, foreign governments and foreign interests play a role, but not necessarily a decisive role. Okay, uh, before we skip into Arab Spring, which you were part of the decision making, so we will have more in-depth question about Arab Spring, but I want to ask several questions about the decision making. So uh, a lot of experts in Washington, DC, it has been a common place, experts like Elliot Cohen, former State Department officials like James Fallows wrote books, criticizing militarization of US foreign policy and downgrading diplomacy, uh, especially the role of the State Department. And uh, my question is, do you think is this a result of the, uh, this uh, short-term successes and uh, immature declaration of victory of regime change? Or uh, is it the cause of it? Is it because that US uh, foreign policy so militarized, militarized that we are thinking only about the intervention when it comes to uh, foreign uh, policy problems? Or is it as a result of these interventions that the, uh, the role of the military increased in foreign policy as an instrument? Mm. Well, you know, I think you do have to distinguish among these cases because the United States military um, isn't the main tool in all of them. It is in some, obviously, uh, certainly the Iraq war. And one reason why you know, US policy is more militarized than some other countries policies is simply because we have the means. I mean, if you're a European country, it's just, it doesn't occur to you to advocate uh, an invasion and occupation of Iraq. I mean, that was one of the differences between the United States and Europe in the run-up to the Iraq war. It's just, uh, it, the Europeans don't have the means, so it's not a policy option. Where the United States has tremendous military power. So it always is an option, and that leads some Americans to believe that we can use that power to accomplish things that to others seem uh, impossible to accomplish. And that is what has led the United States down this road in the, in the past is this incredible optimism that we can put that tool to good use. One of the things that's interesting when you look at this period as a whole though, is I think in many ways, the Obama interventions, if you wanna call them that, mm -hmm. were a response to the over-militarization of the Bush mm -hmm. approach and the uh, invasion of Iraq, which Obama strongly opposed. But one of the things we learned there was that uh, the alternatives to that can be complicated in their own way. So Obama thought he had come up with the anti-Iraq in some ways by doing Libya the way we did it, where the mm -hmm. United States provided just unique military capabilities that only we had in the first phase, but then turned to Europeans to do the bulk of the uh, air policing and airstrikes uh, and security provisions afterwards. So we avoided in the Libyan case, the over-militarization in the sense that, you know, we didn't invade the country and deploy massive forces in Iraq. But then we also discovered that there are consequences to not having such forces in the country uh, afterwards as well. And that's one of my arguments there. People tend in these debates to always argue that the opposite of what we did was the right thing and that would have worked out. Um, but, you know, the truth is when you look at, uh, at, this series of cases, you see that uh, there are costs and consequences of, of uh, sending in massive military forces and staying, but there are also consequences and costs of not doing so. The lesson being, this is just really hard to do. And when you remove an authoritarian or any kind of regime and create a security vacuum, you are buying into a problem that militarily or not militarily, you might not have the answer to after you've created it. Uh, just you know, like the, to uh, reiterate the role of the military. When I uh, when I read that, uh, is this, is this a pattern? Uh, my, uh, I will ask. Uh, I will state some of my findings about your book. The role of General Shinseki in a critical moment in the invasion of Iraq, and his uh, you know like the uh, testimony in the Congress, which uh, angered uh, Paul Wolfowitz and others at the White House, and uh, General Mullins. Uh, uh, intervention, I guess, in the red line, immediate after the red line speech that may be too costly. And it reminds me this Albright Powell uh, debate in 1990s, yeah. you know, like the, why are we keeping that the civilians are more willing to use military, whereas military is, was not willing to use its means 
uh, as the first resort in these crises. And we see multiple instances of it, even in Vietnam War, some of the generals, uh, the US ambassador actually, who was appointed in uh, Saigon at that time was, in his report, he was very reluctant to use force in Vietnam. Is this a pattern or is this just a coincidence? Uh, I think there's a, an interesting pattern there, which is not the one that many people would think if they hadn't given a lot of thought. People sort of reflect, uh, reflexively think, you know, the Pentagon and the generals always want to intervene and, and use military power, and the diplomats just want to, uh, you know, pursue diplomacy. When you look across this period of time, it's actually the opposite. Um, the military tends to be more cautious, you know, arguably because they know what war is like and they know how difficult it is and what the costs are. The military and the CIA, for that matter, have been more skeptical of regime change than, you know, civilians uh, or, or other members of the national security establishment. So that's one thing about the bureaucratics of it that's a little bit counterintuitive. But the other thing about, you know, the Shinseki comment, uh, which I think is important, is it shows this tendency of those civilians who do want to overrule the military and start making the case that we can do this without major military commitments. And that's where I think we get into trouble and we do it, the pattern is you know, pretty consistent over and over again, is underplaying what it's going to cost. And if there's one thing I discovered in looking at all of this history is the tendency to believe you can do it on the cheap, do it meaning get rid of a, a hostile regime on the cheap. Um, now, Iraq obviously wasn't the cheap, but even in Iraq, it ended up costed far more than, than proponents uh, believed at the time. And if you remember the arguments at the time, we won't even have to put in significant peacekeeping forces. The neighbors will help us do it. Iraq can sustain itself because they have oil. Um, security won't be much of a problem. That was misleading. And you know, when people like General Shinseki started to say, actually, we might need a couple hundred thousand troops, as you say, they really angered the civilians. And when others suggested, uh, if you remember another incident where um, economic advisors to President Bush started doing the, estimating the costs of the war, and they were also muzzled. The, in no case did we overstate the costs. Uh, in every case, we understated the cost. And the same thing is true militarily. There's this persistent tendency to think that a small amount of military force will do the trick. And I know you'll want to talk about Libya and Syria. Yeah, yeah. Those are cases where advocates of regime change consistently suggested that just airstrikes or some limited intervention would succeed. And it turns out it always takes a lot more than that. So uh, moving to Arab Spring, uh, uh, you were in the administration and there were uh, several, uh, the revolution in uh, Tunisia, uh, then Egypt, uh, and then Libya. And uh, when I read the book, is, was there a generational difference? And is that generational difference is a result of uh, age, a result of experience, or a result of ideology? So we see, uh, just to, uh, for those who still didn't read the book, uh, there is the principals and deputies, maybe, the backbenchers, right? Uh, the principals, including people like uh, Gates and Ben Panetta, Clinton, Arsh and Biden, actually, Vice President Biden, is yeah. more reluctant to uh, jump off to be on the right side of the history. And whereas the more uh, junior uh, members of the administration, uh, maybe Ben Rhodes, Samantha Power, and others were more willing to engage, especially in these first three revolutions, the Egyptian, Libyan, and uh, uh, Tunisian revolutions. What do you say about that? Is, was yeah. that a, I, like that. You know, I, I do talk about that in the book and describe these generational divides, which you, you accurately described. I think they, they, most, well, they were most evident in the Egypt and Libya debates, mm -hmm. whereas you say on Egypt. So in Egypt, what was the question, right? You have this you know, the revolution, people are rising up. And the question is, how, to what degree should the United States support Mubarak and to what degree should the United States push him out as part of this revolution? And it's true that in, in that case, the principals, the more senior advisors were more cautious. Everybody was for supporting a transition in Egypt, but the more senior advisors wanted to take it more slowly, pursue an orderly transition. And uh, at this you know, famous National Security Council meeting with the president, you know, mostly said, 
let's give Mubarak time. Uh, we'll, we'll support change, but you know, who knows what would happen if Mubarak goes and let's be cautious. And the so-called backbenchers around the table, the younger generation that you describe, said, no, look, you know, we should be on the right side of history. We should be supporting democracy and helped tip the president's uh, choice where he ended up uh, going in front of the cameras and saying that there really needs, Mubarak needs to go and there needs to be a, a transition. And we ended up pushing for an accelerated transition. So if your question is why, I think there are several things at play in that particular case. I think it is partly uh, the more senior advisors or older, you could even say, have, have seen, were less confident that history was moving in a positive direction, let's say. Uh, for the next generation, there was greater hope and idealism that maybe we're finally seeing this change in the Arab world that we've wanted to see for a long time. And if we can just get rid of the, 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 uh, the government, uh, democracy can survive and flourish in Egypt, where I think the, the other advisors were more, let's say, cynical about that or, or realistic about it. And also don't forget, they had a different conception of Egypt because they had you know, been part of US policy for 30 years when Egypt was a close security partner. It had made peace with Israel. It was a, a counterterrorism partner. Mubarak was a loyal ally. And I think you think differently if you've come to appreciate Egypt's role as a partner than if you are you know, maybe in the next generation and, and see the latter half of the Mubarak era where he's repressive and uh, non-democratic and you really wanna believe in this younger generation. So yes, there was definitely a generational divide on Egypt and the same thing pretty much played out on Libya when it came time to decide whether we were gonna intervene there. Same divide right in front of the president with the more senior advisors, including the ones you mentioned, Gates and Biden, more skeptical about US intervening and the uh, younger advisors believing it was a critical thing for the United States to do to, to at least uh, protect the people of Benghazi. I have an interesting audience question, Phil, about Tunisia. Yeah. Uh, this, among these three, they are saying that Tunisia was the most successful one, at least compared to Libya and Egypt. Right. You think it has something to do with the fact that US didn't intervene that much? Right. Now that's the obvious question and it is, it is really interesting. And I sort of flagged that in the book I note that in the book without uh, without delving into it because it, it it's just something you can't help but notice, uh, mm -hmm. as I point out, that of all of the Arab Spring countries, the one that succeeded most was the one that the United States didn't pursue regime change and had very little to do with. And that's why I don't count it as regime change, just to be clear. For me, regime change is not just when there is a change of regime, as there was in Tunisia, but when the when it's a policy choice that you're pursuing it and you do active things to bring it about, and we didn't do that in Tunisia, it happened, you know, it happened uh, spontaneously. Now there are other reasons. I, the reason I don't, uh, you know, go on much about it is there are other reasons to believe that other reasons other than the fact that the United States didn't do it that Tunisia might have succeeded. It's relatively small. You have an economic relationship with France. It's less caught up in these sectarian divides in the region that make it so hard in a place like Iraq to be stable after a, an intervention. Uh, also the fact that the Tunisians were able to observe what happened in Egypt. Uh, Tunisian, let's just say the Tunisian Islamist party saw what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt if they pushed their agenda too far and understood that maybe you need some reconciliation rather than prevailing over the other side. So I wouldn't overstate the point that Tunisia succeeded because the United States had nothing to do with it as if you know, everyone else would succeed if the United States had nothing to do with it. I wouldn't overstate it, but it is kind of a neat thing to notice. And it does, you know, it does at least make you think twice about the notion that the United States is the solution to these problems uh, rather than the cause of some of them. Uh, among the questions that I received, there were several on Syria. And probably this is something uh, I think uh, that will haunt President Obama for a long time. Because even in his last interviews uh, as a president, I still see his, uh, he is uncomfortable about answering questions about Syria. You can see his frustration, at least his body language, that uh, there were so many questions about this. What went wrong in Syria? So the questions, the, uh, there's a chapter about Syria actually in the book. 
And uh, is it, do, uh, the, the questions were mostly about then why not regime change attempt in Syria? Do you think uh, there was an attempt to change the regime in Syria? And it's kind of, you know, like they created those patterns of uh, failure or uh, was United States trying to follow a different set of foreign policy priorities when it came to Syria? Uh, yes, and first let me say, uh, Syria haunts all of us who were involved with it. it. It can only be haunting when you look back at this just terrible period of, of, of killing and repression and refugees and devastation. Uh, nobody can be anything other than haunted by the outcome in Syria. Um, and that raises important policy questions uh, about, you know, what were the alternatives? Did we do the right thing? Should we have done more? Should we have done less? So that's why this is so important. And as you say, I write about it and try to tell the story and draw from these lessons. And yes, I do think, so the, Syria is the one case that I look at in the book where we didn't succeed in getting rid of the regime. All of the other cases, um, the regime left and a different one uh, was put in place. And you can debate how successful it was after that, but we got rid of the regime. In Syria, I describe as a case of attempted regime change because we did things to try to bring about the removal of that government and, uh, and, and putting a different one in place, but it didn't succeed. Mm. And to me, the lesson is, uh, you know, I made the point earlier about we always underestimate what it's going to take to do this, especially when it comes to military force. In that case, especially, it would have taken a lot more military force to get rid of that regime. And just this recipe of giving support to the opposition, putting on sanctions and supporting the opposition to try to bring about regime change, I think you can only say, if you're really being self-reflective about it, ended up escalating and perpetuating the conflict, but not ending it. And that's where uh, you know, I think just uh, uh, honest looking back is really important. A lot of people look back and say, well, the lesson of Syria is you should have done more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and in, again, you can only respect that view because certain, certainly what we did didn't work in a decade of, of, of war and killing and refugees in Syria and extremism didn't benefit anybody. But I caution against the notion, and I really push back hard against this, that there was some quick fix that if only we had provided, you know, more weapons earlier to the opposition or done some airstrikes, you know, all of this would have gone better. In many ways, this is the, you know, opposite side of the Iraq case where in Iraq, we did intervene intermil militarily and obviously we did get rid of Saddam Hussein, but then we were stuck with the situation where no one knew how to fill the security vacuum that we had created by doing so. And I am not persuaded that there was some moment where a little bit of military force or a little bit of arming the opposition would have brought about a transformation in a new regime in Syria without raising that same question as, uh, of what happens uh, once you do get rid of the regime. There is a code word, Phil, red line. And in the yeah. Middle East, it also almost become a symbol of uh, uncertainty in US foreign policy, unpredictability, indecisiveness, and uh, all of the uh, the good part of uh, you know like the today is everybody is writing their memoirs immediately after leaving the administration. So when I read Samantha Powers, Susan Rice, uh, Ben Rhodes, even David Rotkov uh, tells a, a more or less similar account of what went on in the uh, red line in and its aftermath, especially after the use of chemical weapons in Ghouta a year later, a year after the red line statement and how United, uh, President Obama uh, basically decided not to do that. What is your account of what happened about the red line? Do you think it was a wrong uh, judgment on the part of President Obama or do you think it was what it needs to be done at that point? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the red line incident. And I was at the White House at the time and lived through that entire episode. Um, what I mean by misunderstanding is there seems to be a view out there that if Obama had only carried out these planned airstrikes uh, in September 2013, the course of the war in Syria could have been changed and all of these lives could have been saved and you know, the regime could have been removed. Uh, I think that vastly overstates what would have happened if the United States had carried out the airstrikes. Now, to be clear, 
and I'm clear in the book and other things I have written, I supported carrying out those airstrikes at the time. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you can debate whether Obama should have issued the red line in the first place, you know, which he did uh, the, uh, the previous year when he said, if we see them, you know, moving a bunch of chemical weapons around or using them, that would change his calculus. Uh, having made it clear that that was US policy, uh, I think it was important to back that up and show that there would have been a price for crossing that red line. But that would have been about deterring chemical weapons use and degrading the regime's ability to use chemical weapons. It really wouldn't have changed the course of the war. Uh, even pretty significant airstrikes to do that, um, you know, I think the, the reason Obama decided not to do that is he feared just that. We would do the airstrikes, you'd have a short moment and people would applaud and show we were tough, but then the war would go on. They might wait and use chemical weapons again later and we'd have to repeat it. And I think President Obama was particularly concerned about the lack of public and congressional support for, uh, for using military force. And that's why to be precise, and I think this is also misunderstood, Obama actually didn't uh, decide not to strike. If you go back and look at the decision he made and he announced the next day in the Rose Garden, he announced that he was going to Congress to get authorization to use military force. He actually says, and again, read the Rose Garden speech, which was just the day after deciding um, not to proceed that weekend with airstrikes. He says to the public, I've made two decisions. One is we should conduct military strikes on Syria over chemical weapons and even makes a pretty impassioned case for how could we look our children and grandchildren in the eye if we don't respond when they uh, kill civilians with chemical weapons in Syria. But then he said, two, I'm asking Congress to authorize this because I don't want to do this without you know, public and congressional support. So that was this, the decision and what we found immediately afterwards is that there was no congressional support and Congress didn't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. And that's what put us in this awkward position of you know, the president calling for the use of force, but not uh, being in a position to uh, execute it. And then of course, we've got the deal to get rid of the, the chemical weapons anyway. But my point about it, and this is the essential point is carrying out those airstrikes might well have deterred Assad from using them again. And one, one thing, you know, this is an experiment that we don't have to speculate about in some ways because the Trump administration did carry out airstrikes over chemical weapons in 2017 and 2018. And I think you could argue largely deterred the regime from using them again, even though they use chlorine and other chemical weapons. But it didn't change the course of the war and it didn't mean a bigger intervention and it didn't uh, mean regime change. And that's the essential point. Even if Obama had done those strikes in 2013, Assad might not have used chemical weapons, but he would have continued to prosecute the war. And then we would have seen the same dynamic that we saw all along, which was escalation by the United States and its partners behind the opposition, led to escalation by the regime and the Russians and the Iranians, and forced the United States, if it really wanted to do regime change, to intervene much more directly and massively. And uh, for, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, what do you expect, you know, like, would President Obama expect that the Congress would approve such a move after the Benghazi incident in 2012? Uh, there was a, a debate about whether uh, we could succeed in getting that authorization. And to be honest, there was skepticism. Um, but I think what President Obama wanted to do was put that ball in Congress's court. If they weren't willing to do it after Benghazi and all that, okay, fine, then we're just not gonna do it. But if you remember, there were a lot of members of Congress demanding greater action by the United States, take a tough line, criticizing Obama for not being strong enough or willing to use force. So I think what he didn't want to do, and you know, he is a constitutional law professor and a former critic of presidents who abused their authorities. Mm -hmm. And so he was not comfortable being such a president saying, look, the public is against this, Congress is against it, but I'm just going to take my presidential authority. And he was briefed. Um, I, I described the story in the Situation Room where he, you know, unlike the current administration, Obama ran a very careful national security decision making process and went around the room and pulsed his top advisors on, on the intelligence, on the military preparation, on the diplomacy, and also the legal advisor who briefed him that he had the constitutional authority to use force without congressional authorization, though it would be more prudential and uh, helpful to have it. Obama was always uncomfortable with that. And so he decided, 
we'll try to get uh, congressional support. And, and believe me, we did. I mean, and Vice President Biden was deeply engaged in this and Secretary Kerry and National Security Advisor Rice and others trying to uh, persuade Congress. And what we just found back, and this is a lesson about the American public's willingness to do what it takes to change these regimes, members of Congress were like, no way, we're getting calls, you know, 90% of calls telling us we want nothing to do with that. So still a bit of spillover from Iraq, um, mm -hmm. which is another problem for those who say that the lesson in Syria is, you know, we should have been willing to do more. There just wasn't public appetite for that. And, you know, same with Libya, for all the debate about whether we should have put in more peacekeepers afterwards, you're right to mention Benghazi. We, we struggled to get uh, approval for one civilian in Tripoli because of the security situation after uh, Benghazi. So the idea that you could generate public support for significant peacekeepers or real military intervention in these countries, I think just misreads what the public is willing to do. It sounds like, uh, especially in the decision room, there was this cherry picking of historical analogies. So it would be a Vietnam, it would be an Afghanistan if there would be an intervention. And those who support the intervention would argue that it would be a Rwanda, right? It would be something totally bad, out of control that uh, we had to uh, intervene at that moment. But you mentioned multiple times Congress and <laughs> among all of the patterns that you mentioned, I discovered a, uh, you know, like the, uh, a pattern of congressional activism and it comes to regime change, especially in Afghanistan through Charlie Wilson's attempt in Iraq yeah. in 1998, Iraq Liberation Act, and in the aftermath, even in Libya, there was this congressional activism. And mm -hmm. uh, you sound like you are, uh, you have disapproval. The book has disapproval about this increasing congressional activism when it comes to regime change together with political elites. Because I look at that and you mentioned the Congress and you mentioned the political elites in Washington DC that supports the intervention one after another. Do you think uh, this is another pattern and it will continue? And nowadays, of course, we are seeing an increasing activism in foreign policy, especially in the Congress. Mm -hmm. And do you think it is something uh, right uh, for the US foreign policy for its long-term interest? Uh, it's a fascinating question on the role of Congress in these debates. You're right to notice the pattern. And in many of these cases, Congress played a very big role. Um, and there's always tension between the executive branch and Congress on this. And I particularly describe that role. I mean, you're right to mention Charlie Wilson in Afghanistan. Although, of course, the administration then was pretty enthusiastic too. Uh, I, I particularly emphasize it when it comes to Libya, because mm. you know, that was a case where Obama, his instincts were certainly not to intervene. You know, his mm. whole, he was elected president against intervention in the Middle East and you know, spreading democracy. And I don't think that was where his, well, I know that's not where his instincts were, but I describe, uh, seeing on CNN some members of Congress start to make the case for action. And that's when I started to realize we're not going to be able to stop this. There's going to be media uh, pressure and congressional pressure to act. And, you know, that's partly in the nature of things. Uh, um, members of Congress, uh, you know, it would be typical of the executive branch to say what's well, easy for them to say, because then they don't, you know, they're not responsible for what happens afterwards, but that does put the pressure on the administration to act. I think in Syria, the same thing is true. Uh, Obama's instincts were not to intervene, but it's difficult to even you know, testify before Congress and not have answers to these questions. And you get this pressure, what is the United States doing about it? Which is again, a very American thing because, because we have the means, we're seen as having the responsibility to act. But again, that's why it's one of the main reasons why Obama insisted on authorization legislation for the chemical weapons airstrikes because he, he pictured just that. Congress clamoring for action, denouncing his inaction, uh, pressuring the administration to do something and then doing it and then finding out later that that support disappears when something goes wrong as it inevitably does when you intervene uh, militarily. So that's why I think his attitude was if you guys are going to clamor for action, press me to act, fine, authorize it, and we'll go ahead. That becomes much more difficult. And you see now how, you know, most of these interventions now are still taking place under the one, the authorization of the military force from 2001, mm -hmm. uh, because Congress is not willing to 
uh, take responsibility and authorize a specific new intervention. And that, that's a, a real problem with the system where we're still intervening. Those auth that authorization you know, was about uh, uh, Al Qaeda and affiliated groups, which is just very different from what we're dealing with now, but Congress, despite pressure from the administration, hasn't been willing to authorize a new one. And uh, another question uh, from our viewers in Turkey, the, uh, about the Syria, of course, it is something that, especially after the refugee flow, <coughs> export yep. insecurity, Turkey was uh, basically had a lot of issues about Syria and US decisions in Syria, especially the YPG issue. And do you see any similarity about supporting the bad guys for the short-term US interest and which would lead to some disastrous consequences later when you think about the US support for YPG? Um, let's just say from the start that none of us succeeded in Syria and that applies to Turkey and the United States. And uh, obviously Turkey played a major role here and we were closely involved with the Turks from beginning to end. And, and just as I've described US policy not being always entirely consistent, neither was Turkish. Um, yeah, Turkey, if you remember initially, was reluctant to move in the direction of regime change in Syria. And I remember dealing with our Turkish colleagues who wanted more time to try to help persuade Assad to reform because Turkey had invested a lot in Syria and had uh, important ties there. So Turkey actually, I think, came around to regime change in Syria after the United States did, but then became an even more enthusiastic proponent of it. And uh, consistently tried to push the United States to do more to finally get rid of the Assad regime. Um, as to the question of, you know, supporting the YPG and the consequences of that, and it is another thing that has, you know, long-term and unintended consequences, there was an important U.S.-Turkish piece behind that too, which was that Turkey constantly said it had an alternative to the YPG, Free Syrian Army, other opposition forces, to fight both the regime, this Syrian regime, and the Islamic State, but never was really able to deliver that uh, entity, that military force, to do so. And so I think it was only out of expediency and desperation and the lack of alternatives that the United States turned to the YPG as a partner to deal with ISIS because it was a, the wolf at the door. But, uh, but like all of these things, there are consequences of doing that, and that has you know, undermined U.S. relations with Turkey and created other problems uh, within Syria. Yeah, it is uh, among the questions that they uh, refer to my quote, one question that would uh, he invite YPG members to dinner. So it is, uh, so it is the same, uh, you can understand the reaction in Turkey and long-term consequences, especially when this uh, US support took place, when the PKK launched its uh, attacks to Turkey, especially the civilian targets. I mean, I mean this is the, it is related to that. And it's a, it's a fair comment about you know, wishful thinking and euphemisms. Th those quotes that, that you pull out, you know, were interesting. That's, you know, Robert Gates and then I think Milt Bearden who was at the CIA uh, talking about our support for the Mujahideen in euphemistic terms, as you quote, that's not who you'd want your daughter to marry. It's not who you would bring home for dinner. It's a euphemism because what they really mean is these were, you know, warlords and extremists. And it shows you make those compromises. And to me, the only lesson of that is understand what you're doing. Um, if you're going to be supporting armed groups on the ground, don't, you know, pretend to others or yourself uh, that these might be, you know, moderate democratic partners. If they're armed groups as part of an insurgency, then that's what uh, they are. And, and there are consequences that come along with doing so. Uh, Phil, I know that our time is up, but there are a couple of questions that I want to raise in the next four or five minutes. Uh, apologies for that. The first one is uh, U.S. policy in Iran and Venezuela. So you mentioned all of those lessons, yeah. right? That it kind of keep failing, but U.S. is still trying uh, in Iran, right? A little bit. It is not obvious, but the maximum pressure, the end result seems that, you know, like not President Trump, but some in the administration would be happy to have a regime change in Iran and more openly Venezuela. We don't know what's happening with President Trump and uh, you know, like the, the recent revelations about the meeting in Mexico, but we see that uh, there was an immense pressure to Maduro government, you know, like the, to change the regime, recognizing the opposition as the legitimate government 
How would you uh, explain that after all these failures, why United States is trying again? So I'm glad you bring this up even as we reach the end because it's a really important part of it. And it's the part that links the history to the present. Because in some ways that's why I wrote the book is watching the Trump administration go down this path now, whether it's Iraq or Venezuela or Syria, uh, sorry, Iran or Venezuela or Syria, but particularly Iran, it occurred to me that before we do that, pursue regime change in Iran, maybe we should learn the lessons of previous cases, even if they're very different, and understand these patterns where once the administration sets down that course, it tends to overstate the threat and underestimate the costs and unintended consequences. And I do think there are a lot of important lessons for these two cases, you know, the most important of which include how hard it is to do. That don't imagine that just putting sanctions on the country or even providing modest amounts of military force to the opposition gets rid of the regime. Uh, history shows us that the opposite is the case. Look at, I mentioned Cuba Bay of Pigs, but we've been trying to get rid of that regime ever since. And we've had sanctions on Cuba ever since. And Cuba is a lot smaller and poorer than Iran, and yet the regime is still there. Uh, North Korea has been isolated, sanctions. The regime is still there, and it also you know, has acquired nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. So it really is fanciful and unlikely to imagine that if we just put a little bit more pressure on uh, Iran, that somehow the regime will collapse and you know, a, a better regime will come into power. It just doesn't work that way. And Venezuela is also interesting, too, because Venezuela you would have thought had like better conditions for regime change because you had the whole world saying the regime is illegitimate, put on multilateral sanctions. But even in that case, in some ways, it has strengthened the regime rather than weakened it. So it's a, everything I write about is a cautionary tale about what we think we can accomplish in these countries now. Sometimes, you know, you have to live with a situation and manage it and contain it rather than thinking you can make it better with all of the costs and unintended consequences. And that's what I worry about in Iran, because let's say the sanctions and maximum pressure don't work to bring about, so they, they create misery for the Iranian population, they push Iran out of the nuclear deal and lead it to start expanding its nuclear program again, it acts more aggressively in the region, so the sanctions didn't work, so then you take the next step of start supporting opposition, and then do you take the next step of you know, providing material support and before you do that, it's probably useful to look back at these lessons and how they ended up before going down that road again. Uh, two questions, the last two questions, I promise. One is uh, the next administration, uh, whoever uh, is basically will come, you know, like the, with a victory after uh, probably next week, the week after next week. So would you expect any difference between two different uh, individuals, candidates, foreign policy? Uh, in regards to regime change. So we know at least what President Trump is uh, willing to do. But how about the, uh, Biden? Yeah, well, look, there are obviously enormous differences between the two in, you know, in, in, in temperament and, and style and on policies uh, as well. There, there's one thing, uh, arguably, that is about the United States now rather than any particular candidate, which is a lack of appetite for military interventions. I mean, you hear the debate about ending forever wars or endless wars is a bipartisan debate. In fact, you hear it from President Trump, but Vice President Biden also says uh, no more endless wars. So that's a quite American thing. Americans you know, are fed up with the costs of Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think are enthusiastic about military intervention or regime change. That said, at least on Iran, the two have very different policies that I would argue at least makes regime change a greater uh, possibility under President Trump than Vice President Biden, simply because it's the logic of his policy. He doesn't want the nuclear deal. He's uh, increasing maximum pressure on Iran. And he doesn't really seem to have an answer other than, well, we'll just keep the pressure on until the regime goes away. Whereas Vice President Biden is also uh, concerned about Iran and its role in the neighborhood and its nuclear program, but has a plan of containing the nuclear program with a nuclear deal and using diplomacy. So neither one is eager uh, in its pursuit of regime change, but I think the risk of going down that road is far greater with President Trump than it is with Vice President Biden. The last question is again about Turkey after talking about Nusadr. 
uh, some viewers from Turkey is asking what would what could be the U.S. role in the coups and coup attempts in Turkey, and uh, if you know because. There is this, you know, like the interview with uh, the Putschist in 1980, Kenan Evran, who said when he met with the state, uh, Secretary of State for the first time, he said, why were you so late? A statement like that. And uh, after- Sorry, what, what, what was that a reference to? Uh, why, why uh, he asked the, uh, the leader of the Putschist why the military was so late intervening. And uh, there were, uh, especially after the July 15 coup attempt, there was a lot of debate about the uh, potential U.S. role, and it is not only the U.S. role, it is the presence of the, basically, the person who Turkey holds responsible for the coup attempt is in the uh, United States. And especially for many in Turkey, what, uh, one of the things that bothered them most was uh, the not using the C word, the coup word, in the first two statements that came from first Secretary of State, then from the White House. So uh, what is your, uh, basically, you were at the White House. Uh, I know that you were in touch with your colleagues from Turkey at that night. So what happened? Why the uh, second statement, of course, didn't have a C statement, you know, like the stating that it was a quit. Right. So I had left the White House. I don't know if you said I was at the White House. I was no longer there when this happened. I was out of government, so I can't speak for mm -hmm. the debate that took place within government. I do know that it always in these situations, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, the, the fog of war, getting conflicting information. So sometimes governments are slow to define or attribute things. Um, I don't know how long it took them to say it was a coup, but it didn't take that long. I think the consensus in the US government and among analysts is that there was uh, a coup attempt, but you know, in the fog of war as conflicting things are coming in, I do know that it's a habit to be careful and figure out what actually is happening before you say anything about it. And I also know, and this would be the subject of an entire other uh, hour long discussion, that I don't think the US government you know, has seen any evidence that the person that you're referring to uh, was involved in the coup and therefore uh, should be uh, held accountable for it in some judicial manner, you know, which I know is the whole debate about extradition and all of that. So uh, probably, you know, like the now there will be a lot of questions that is, you know, Turkey sent the necessary uh, evidences about this and probably we need to talk about this more. So uh, I try to be in this, uh, at least in this uh, book, in this uh, panel, I try to be loyal and talk about the book. And there are so many questions coming about the U.S. foreign policy. I try not to ask those and I apologize <laughs> for those viewers who also ask those questions and hopefully we will uh, have you again uh, Phil and one more time congratulations for the book and uh, hopefully we will see you again. Thank you so much Kilic I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about it and thanks to everybody for joining it's really interesting. Thank you.